We have already seen how higher derivatives can enable functions to be analyzed for critical points, including maxima and minima. Another even more powerful application of higher derivatives is approximating different functions as polynomials. This is really useful because the resulting polynomials, although approximate, are often much easier to study and evaluate than the original functions. The sine x function shown here can be fully described by an infinite series of polynomial terms. Here we can see the comparison with just five terms as an approximation. Such polynomial functions are typically easier to use than the original function. For example, calculate the sine of 2.35 radians. How would we do this? We could draw a triangle with the given angle and then measure the length of the opposite and hypotenuse sides. The sine of the angle of interest then would just be the ratio of these two sides. Another traditional method would be to look up the angle in tables of known values. And these printed tables would give us values to some approximate precision. Neither of these approaches are ultimately ideal for calculations. The application we're interested in is to use series approximations. And here again, we can see that our sign of the angle in question can be written as some long polynomial. The power of such series approximation is that we can change the value of interest. And we can calculate, in this case, the sign of any angle to any precision we like. We can see quite easily that this approximation is a series of powers. Each power term is weighted by some fraction, such as 1 over 6 or 1 over 20. Recall that polynomials are a series involving coefficients and powers of x. This is a finite series, up to some number of terms n. Writing this as a summation, we can start from 0 up to some n power and continue increasing the power of the polynomial. For example, a second degree polynomial, such as 3 plus 2x plus x squared. To intuitively understand what the different terms contribute to the polynomial, we can simply remove them one by one and compare the curves. For a perfect approximation, we would keep all of these terms. If we reduce the number of terms, we can save on calculation time, but at the expense of accuracy. Again, for a simple polynomial, watch what happens when we remove terms. And as we see, all the terms intersect at x is equal to 0. We can say that the polynomial series is centered at x equal to 0. We can also see that at x equal to 0, the lower degree polynomial 3 plus 2x shows a very good approximation to the real function. Similar to a polynomial series, a power series is a sequence of terms, but in this case, the series is infinite. We can also define where we would like this series to be centered. So rather than zeroing at x equal to zero, as in the polynomial example, we can take any center point we like and express our power series from that point. Notice if c is equal to zero, then we have the same series expansion as for our polynomial. If we expand out this summation, we can see that the series starts at a0 and expands increasing powers of x. This, of course, extends from n is equal to 0 all the way to n is equal to infinity. Our original polynomial function of 3 plus 2x plus x squared could be represented by a power series of 6 plus 4 on x minus 1 plus 1 on x minus 1 to be squared, and so on. While the power series has indeed infinite terms, most of these terms can be zero. Again, to intuitively understand what the different terms contribute to the power series, we can simply remove each term and compare the curves. Keeping the first two terms as shown in red gives us a linear function, while just the first term provides us with a constant value of six. We can see now that all of these terms are centered or intersect at x is equal to one. And indeed, we can center the power series wherever we like. This style of approximation is of course trivial in the case of polynomials, since the functions are explicitly defined in x and we already know the powers involved. How can we apply power series functions to more complex functions? To do so, we need to know how the function changes around the area of interest. Hence, we need to know the derivatives of the function. We can then extrapolate the function around the center as a power series involving not just orders of x, and x to the power of n, but also derivative orders. This is referred to as a Taylor series. This type of power series approximates complex functions by adding increasing higher orders of derivatives and x terms, and then weighting them by a decreasing factor of 1 over n, factorial. 
To create any Taylor series, we first start by building a power series, in this case centered at zero. Then we add the coefficients. Now these coefficients are the derivatives of the function. The zero ordered derivative itself is of course just a function. We see that we're evaluating the function and its derivatives at x is equal to zero, where the series is centered. Next, we weight the coefficients by the order factorial, such that the factorial increases as we go to higher and higher orders. For example, the factorial of three is three by two by one, which is six. The zero factorial is one. And of course, since x to the power of zero is one, we can simplify this series such that we start by evaluating the function itself at zero, and then we add a series of derivatives, each with increasing order of x, and each with increasing weighting factors from one to two to six, and so on. This infinite series, of course, can be written using a summation, and here we are summing from n is equal to zero to n is equal to infinity, that derivative order f to the n at zero by the x power order x to the n, and all divided by a weighting of n factorial. This implies that higher order derivatives contribute less and less to the approximation. For example, for n is equal to 10, we've got one over 10 factorial, which is a very, very large number. Nonetheless, these higher order derivatives will contribute more and more the further we are from the center point of the series, such that as we go to very, very large values of x, the higher order factors will dominate. The easiest example here to start with is the function e to the x. All its derivatives are equal to the function itself. First, we determine how many terms do we want. Let's say that we want to expand the series up until the fourth order. We write down the, the standard form of the Taylor series centered at zero. Next, we define the, the function and its derivatives. Since we know all of the derivatives of e to the x are the same, we can simply replace these forms in the Taylor series. Next, we want to evaluate the function e to the x and its derivatives all at some point x is equal to zero. Rewriting the Taylor series again, we can see that most of the terms are e to the zero, which of course is equal to one. Rewriting this series now, we will have the final form of the Taylor expansion. Now, in using this series, we can calculate e to the x for any value of x we like. And visualizing this, we can compare the real function e to the x, where our simple approximation comprised of five terms. We can see that our simple approximation is accurate up until x is equal to two. Afterwards, the approximation starts to diverge from the real answer. If we increase to 10 terms of Taylor series, we can see the approximation becomes more and more accurate. We can also note that the series are centered at x is equal to zero. Our next question is, can we center the Taylor series at some other point? There are cases when a function cannot be defined as a Taylor series centered at zero. A good example is when there are no derivatives at x is equal to zero, such as for natural log of x. The area of interest may not be near zero either. In such cases, we can define a Taylor series of the function centered at some point of our choosing, using a more general form of the Taylor series. As was the case for the power series expansion centered at c, our Taylor series follows the same notation with the introduction of a center point c. For example, our approximation of the function e to the x can be centered at a value of x is equal to three. Again, for e to the x, the derivatives are all e to the x, such that we have numerous instances of e to the three. If we visualize this, we can easily see now that our Taylor expansion centered at x equal to three diverges at x is equal to zero, but converges to the exact value near x is equal to three. Hence, we can tailor our series to center at any point of interest. In the case where we use a Taylor series centered at zero, this is sometimes referred to as Maclaurin series. And of course, the general Taylor series reduces to the Maclaurin series when we set c is equal to zero. A special case of a Taylor series is, is the binomial expansion. A binomial contains two terms, such as a plus b all raised to the power of k. If a is equal to one and b is equal to x, the binomial takes the form of a function one plus x all raised to the power of k. The simple binomial approximation is one plus kx, and this is valid when x is less than one and kx is also less than one. Visualizing the simple binomial approximation, 
we can see that in the case of 1 plus x to the power of a half, this reduces to a linear function of 1 plus x over 2, which we can see diverges after x is equal to 0 0.2. If you would like better agreement between the two functions, we would have to add more terms to the Taylor expansion. At the moment, this 1 plus kx are the first two terms. In order to prove this, we can create the Taylor series for this binomial function centered at x equal to zero. Again, we start by simply building a power series comprised of coefficients, which are the derivatives, and the weightings using the factorials. The derivatives for the function in question, which is one plus x all to the k, can be derived quite easily. And in this case, we will derive the first three derivatives so including the function itself, this will be the first four terms of the expansion. Evaluating these functions at x equal to zero, we can have the following coefficients. And next we combine all of this into the Taylor series for the binomial. Here this results in one plus kx plus k on k minus one on x squared over two and so on. Next, we can look at how this higher order approximation compares with the simple binomial expansion using just the two terms. And here we can see using four terms in the Taylor expansion, the binomial approximation is much more accurate. But nonetheless, the simple binomial expansion using the first two terms can give a relatively quick approximation to the function. A more general expression for the binomial expansion involving any values for a and b can be written as such. As with any Taylor series, we are free to compute with as many terms as we need for some desired calculation. And this is at the cost of more and more computational energy. Finally, let's look at the concept of L'Hopital's rule. This is a method to enable us to evaluate functions that give us initially some indeterminate value. An indeterminate value is often in the form of zero divided by zero or infinity divided by infinity. This can occur when evaluating functions at some limit, especially when comprised of a numerator and some denominator, such as this quotient of sine x over x. As x goes to zero, the function predicts that we'll have zero divided by zero, which is an indeterminate value. However, when we evaluate the function itself, using a graph, we can see easily that there is a value at x is equal to zero, and this is a value of one. So we know that the limit as x goes to zero does exist for this function. In order to solve this problem, we can evaluate the functions as Taylor series. The idea here is that both components of the quotient, the sine of x and the x, are expressed as two functions using a Taylor series. So we will have two Taylor series, and we will evaluate them as x goes to zero. Here we will derive a general expression for any two functions. We will call the top function f of x and the bottom function g of x. We will expand both Taylor series from zero and then we will evaluate the Taylor series to determine the value as x goes to zero. To do so, we evaluate it in steps such that we look at the initial functions themselves, which we know are indeterminate as x goes to zero. Then we evaluate the first derivative quotient. And if that is also indeterminate, we continue and we evaluate the next higher derivative quotient. We can see here that the coefficients cancel. So we can simplify this and say that as the limit of x goes to zero, f of x over g of x is equal to the ratio of the first derivatives or the ratio of the second derivatives or the ratio of the higher derivatives. We continue this until a determinate form is found. Going back to our example of sine of x over x, instead of having to write the full Taylor series expansions for both the numerator and denominator, we can simply evaluate the ratio of the derivatives until we find a determinant value. The derivative of sine of x is equal to cosine x, and the derivative of x is equal to one. As x goes to zero, cosine of zero is one, and one divided by one gives us a determinant value of one. And indeed, when we look at the previous graph we used, we can indeed see that we expect a value of one for this function. Another example is to look at the case where we have the need to go to higher derivatives. In this case, we look at the function one minus cosine x over x squared, and we can see that the first derivatives still give us a indeterminate value of zero over zero. We must continue and use the second derivatives, which provides us a determinate value. Hence, we can say that for this function, as x goes to zero, we expect a value of a half. Another example is to look at when our determinant value is infinity. 
In this case, let's look at this function e to the x minus 1 over x cubed and evaluate it as x goes to 0. The ratio of the first derivatives is e to the x over 3x squared, and this gives us a value of 1 over 0, which is infinity, which is a determinate form. As ever, this video is a starting point for your studies, so please continue to use your textbook and practice example problems in order to develop your Taylor series methods.